I'd like to introduce um, Zev Fisher, who's the CEO of Pakama. Um, Zev is a, an intellectual property expert based in Cambridge. He's the founder of Pakama, which is an innovative collaborative ecosystem for the IP profession. Um, he's a UK solicitor and Israeli advocate and also a self-educated software programmer who has been personally involved in several startup companies as a software programmer and manager. And I'll let him introduce the rest of the panelists. Right, so um, Gonzalo who, uh, is uh, the uh, founder and CEO of uh, Syndicate Room. Um, for full disclosure, Picama is a Syndicate Room portfolio company. It's a, a platform that um, supports or facilitates funding of innovative uh, UK companies. Uh, most of them, I think, with uh, a considerable IP portfolio. Uh, we're working together with both a portfolio company. We're also looking at the IP portfolios that go through uh, Syndicate Room. So, and we used to uh, share the same building, but now with Syndicate Room's grand success, they moved to a posh location <laughs> and left us there. And I think someone, someone finally rented the office that you vacated. Um, Ken uh, is uh, a um, CEO of a gaming and uh, fitness uh, startup, right? Um, based in uh, uh, North Wales uh, and um, uh, with quite a lot of IP in the gaming business and uh, quite a lot of experience turning it uh, around. Um, Raj, so yeah, I, I have to say this. So I, I looked up everyone yesterday and Raj uh, has this startup that creates a little device that attaches an IoT um, thingy that attaches to anything and makes you identify something that you lost. So for some of you, this may not be a problem, but I use I Find My iPhone quite frequently. <laughs> and this is Find My iPhone for everything. It's 20, 20 quid, right? That's right. And if you attach it to your laptop, and when you lose your laptop, buy this. If you take <laughs> anything from this event, that's the one. That's the thing. <laughs> um, <Thanks>. And um, <laughs> sorry, I forgot how to pronou pronounce the name. Um, uh, yeah. Siva, uh, yeah. Is, uh, Siva is uh, the founder of Robotics Club, uh, which is both an AI company and produces um, uh, actual robots uh, or humanoids uh, and does lots of cool things uh, with a considerable IP portfolio working with a lot of companies that have uh, further uh, IP portfolios. Um, so um, uh, yeah, that's uh, Siva and um, uh, yeah, that's it. We can start, I think. Is, is that okay, the, the order? Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, our subject is, is commercialization of uh, IP and the role of IP in commercialization. I think it's a fairly difficult uh, and uh, hard to nail down uh, sort of subject. Um, and uh, the first question that I have to the entire uh, panel is, uh, is, is IP a separate asset? Is you, can you look at IP as a separate thing uh, which you can value and, and uh, uh, regard as, as its own thing, or is it always necessarily attached to the product or the service that you're selling, and is part of its defensibility or, uh, or value uh, uh, within the product itself? Um, why don't we start with you, Siva? Yeah, we actually work with various partners, and uh, like non-disclosure agreement, which they discussed earlier, we have something called collaborative agreement with various parties. And uh, we want to have that collaborative agreement in a contractual stage and also in implementation stage and also on IP disclosure stage. So we go as a robotics club. And, uh, and also like we are educating the technology to the various schools, universities and to the uh, government. So we should have this IP. That's what but is it but is it a separate thing? Can you can you look at the IP as a, as a standalone thing, or is it always part of the product? I think it is uh, part of the product because the reason is like if you don't have an IP or the name, uh, then you know it's very difficult to explain, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence. 
we have a company called AES2 and uh, they have about 17 patents pending. So because of introducing this technology uh, without uh, IP, it must be difficult, in my opinion. And can you email me before the event saying, <laughs> I have a lot of experience on this point? <laughs> So well, it, it's more about the commercialization, to be quite honest. Um, you know, we get a lot of people come to us as a uh, software developer with fantastic ideas. And, you know, it, it, the emails that I get saying that um, we've got this IP that's so valuable. And I've got to say, you know, they are very, very good ideas. And yes, they've, they've got um, something that you could take a patent on. Are they commercially viable? Um, a lot of times the answer is no. And it's always the danger is, is, is it something that is commercially viable? So, so what is the value of the IP? Is it a good idea that could be patented? And, and I've been involved in some um, issues where somebody spent, one in particular, spent a great deal of money with patent attorneys actually taking a patent out on something and actually ended up losing their, their, their house and, and going bankrupt um, because they went down this blind avenue without realising that it, at the end of the day it wasn't actually commercially viable. So it's always very difficult and, and certainly within the software industry that is such a rapid moving environment, first to market can sometimes be a little bit more important than um, actually having a patent. Now, having said that, having a patent for investment and for protection is still important, but it's, it's a very, I mean, as you said, you know, when we were in the, in the room, it's a very difficult subject and it's a very difficult answer to give. Is it important? In some instances, yes. But the realization of, of is the idea commercially viable, I think, is something that needs to be understood. And there seems to be a, a, a disjoint sometimes between commercial world and, and I know again you touched on it, the real world of, of patent attorneys and, and um, as I say, the commercial, it, commercial world. What about you, Gonzalo? Do, do you see any funding rounds uh, based primarily on the IP or is it always a side thing that comes alongside the company? No, no, I think it's, um, so t uh, in terms of your previous question, just very quickly, in terms on whether the IP is the whole thing, what I've seen is that it depends a lot on the industry per industry basis. So such things like uh, software, mm. then yes, you may have the best patent ever and the best idea ever, but it all comes down to execution and really the, the driving forces behind it. It's just, it's just a box, a really important box that needs to be ticked. Whereas um, in places like uh, biotech or, or life sciences, then the IP is far more important and actually the IP can be incredibly valuable without anything else around it, people, idea, business model or any sort of revenue whatsoever. So it really comes down to, to which industry. From what we see is that uh, IP is, uh, on the companies that the IP is relevant, it is incredibly important. It's very important to have, for example, the patents in place um, uh, for for the investors to decide whether to invest or not is w again is one else those very very important tick boxes that really needs to to be ticked, and uh, and that's why us as a company what we do is we outsource uh, the the research behind those patents to become as it happens, um, so that to make sure that's one more tick that is there it's in place and investors can feel the the confidence to move on to things like the, the management in behind, the idea, the sustainability of the business model and so on. So it's, it's um, you, you would say that for some companies it's a defensibility and ticking a box kind of thing and for some companies it has, it has <laughs> a lot of standalone value depending on the industry. Yeah, I, I talk a lot with <coughs> entrepreneurs as you, as you can imagine and, uh, and they tend to be always very optimistic and very optimistic on the value of the IP uh, and completely underestimate that actually the execution is the execution is, is, is equally or more important. Um, so it is, you know, some industries is, is very, very important. When a third of our investments is in life sciences and in those industries, it's, it's, you know, it's absolutely crucial to have it and to have it right. Uh, some others, it's so much more down to execution. You need the IP to make sure that 
at the very least, you either delay or make it slightly more complicated for competitors to come in and start competing with you. What's your view, Raj? Yeah, I think um, I very much agree with some of the uh, principles behind it's different industry to industry and especially uh, biotech and nanotech and that kind of it's really uh, more crucial maybe and uh, it also really depends on what is the definition of IP uh, and in in some industries it's all about patents and, and the perception but IP uh, could be much more than that there is uh, we spoke about brand uh, earlier uh, we uh, personally have a very interesting brand uh, story where we had to go through a rebranding uh, exercise as well, uh, which happy to uh, share. But there is also know-how, there is trade secrets, there is, um, there's a lot of other intangibles. And if uh, the question is, can you separate that from the product? Um, not at the very early stages, because I think those are so uh, into, uh, they're just, very well tied together so the um, uh, in some companies the uh, heart of the ip actually is embedded in the product so it's very difficult i would say to separate the two conversely um i i remember a story um when in the happy days when intellectual ventures uh, had unlimited amount of cash and would just buy any questionable patent um, that that came into the market for the rough price of three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and I, I do recall um, a a client that I got extremely frustrated with because he refused to do anything with his piece of technology, but prosecute his patent, and eventually sold that patent for the magic number of three hundred thousand dollars and paid back his mortgage uh, and get rich, but was quite happy with the, <laughs> with the result. But that, that seems to have died up completely. And uh, we, we don't really see that much standalone IP sales, do we? Or do, do any of you have a different experience? Life sciences, life sciences you do. Life sciences, the companies in life sciences are, it's almost like magic. They seem never to quite die. They might go from <laughs> like 10 employees to 100 down to one, and then someone buys the patent five years after the last employee has left and you want, you know, it's, um, but other than that, uh, you know, hardware is another sector that, that really matters. But, um, but yeah, other than that, I think that uh, it's. And d do you think um, um, the, uh, that type of analysis would change if in, in different sizes of companies and not just industries? Do you think that larger companies, so I, I remember that we had, uh, we had a, a software patent drafting department that we used to uh, fondly call the, the non-patentable subject matter department. <laughs> and we used to do a lot of work for IBM, just file <laughs> patents for everything. Do you think that in, in larger companies there is this company culture of just patent everything and, uh, and try and get, uh, get license fees from the people who <laughs> cannot defend? Uh, that's for me, yes. <laughs> Actually, I think uh, I read an article of uh, Richard Branson founder. He was telling that, you know, creating another brand within a very established brand. Uh, so he was telling how difficult it is to have create another IP and creating the context or idea into a context. And I, we work with another company, the founder is here, it's uh, Shadow Robots, uh, you know, uh, they do the dextrose hands, robotic hands. Uh, so when you say dextrose robotic hands, that is the idea, but to bring that into a context and to for the people to invest into that idea, then you need uh, some similar IP. And we also <coughs> work with some nano robots, and these robots are now sitting in city banks, you know, working like a receptionist. And uh, even that, we are speaking to UK banks also. Uh, you know, one thing, the disruption is very slow, but it's coming. You know, who thought Amazon would be the number one and, you know, it taken away all the other companies? So I would say strongly IP is something very important. So large companies versus small companies. Um, and, and maybe large companies having a strategy to buy portfolios, th does that impact your thinking as a small company? Um, I, I would say it um, definitely does. I mean, given um, 
I, our experience as a startup company and having actually spent uh, in a very large corporate, uh, the way they would approach patent portfolio is more of that tick box exercise. Sometimes they don't even uh, value it, but it's just, oh, okay, something interesting, let's file it, we'll think about it later. But uh, in a startup, and especially for venture capitalists, they are, I would say, more strategic than just using it as a tick box exercise because they do want to see the enforceability of, um, of a patent portfolio. Um, yeah, uh, so we went uh, sort of one, filing a patent is one of the first things we did uh, as a startup uh, company. And uh, we never really uh, researched thoroughly the trademark landscape. And uh, we ended up having uh, built a brand for more than a year and a half to realize we have to rebrand it. Uh, and it was just also how we were led by our venture capitalist investors. Uh, so at that point, we had um, almost quarter of a million in funding. And a lot of it had gone into the patent portfolio, but we never protected the brand. Uh, uh, but eventually, it worked out fine because we didn't have to buy a license from uh, anyone else, and we were still able to rebrand it, maintaining some of the core elements of the proposition uh, and so on. And uh, we learned to be a lot more strategic as an uh, earlier stage uh, venture than what would be a corporate tech box exercise. And so we've, we've done industry, uh, different industries, different uh, uh, sizes of companies. Let's talk about fast versus slow. And I've, I've recently had um, and uh, uh, just coming back again to, to patents for a minute, and uh, maybe we'll talk a bit about trademarks. Um, so I, I've recently had a meeting with, uh, with a company that uh, where um, biotech company, IP very important, no doubt, um, and um, one of the PCTs uh, positive search report. And I asked the question, okay, you have a positive search report, and clearly IP is a lot of value to you, why aren't you rushing it? And why aren't you get bring that patent to ground? And you mentioned that enforceability is a, is a main thing. And, um, and th th that company's um, uh, founders have said, well, that's how we're being advised, to slow everything down um, b because it, it creates cash flow ben benefits. And I on w went on waving, uh, it, yes, it does create cash flow ben benefits, but cash flow <laughs> is not the only thing, it's, it's one of many aspects. Do, do you think that, um, or do you feel from your experience that granted patents where they can be obtained reasonably easily are more important than patent applications? To support funding, for example? Um, I can't see why, you, why can't you do both? Uh, well, when, when you have the choice, oh. and if you have the choice of rushing your portfolio faster, uh, w would that be an exercise that you think uh, in potential investors would appreciate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as a as a as an investor, I would definitely you know just say go go for both and pay more people like yourselves to to keep on going it faster. Definitely not slower, that's for sure. But that's me with an entrepreneurial mind. <laughs> right. So, what would having having the perspective of uh, of startups that need to deal with uh, short cash flows? Do you agree, or is it always? Let's just spend as little as possible at this point. Um, uh, if you I, want I, to, Anke. Well, I, I don't think it's. <laughs> I don't think it's the top of most startups' agendas, mm -hmm. whether that's right or whether it's wrong. They've usually got other pressure points, um, and and that's the issue. I don't think there's enough small to medium-sized enterprise advisors, certainly in our parts of the world, which is Wales, and we're in. Um, Aberystwyth, which is a long way from anywhere, um, that can give good, sound advice. I mean, we end up being defaulted to the Welsh Assembly, <coughs> which I won't get politically involved with, but um, it, to, to get the advice, I know it was interesting you, you talking about trademark. One of the businesses I was involved in setting up some time ago traded for um, 18 months, and we had the same issue. We had to rebrand and we spent a great deal of money on developing that particular brand. Had we have done the research in the first instance about trademarks, and we'd, we'd actually done a lot of work in relation to patents, we'd have saved ourselves a great deal of money and actually spent 18 months developing a brand that we could have kept. Um, 
in my mind, I don't think there's enough done in relation to giving correct advice to SMEs that they can understand. Um, and it's refreshing when you know you come along to an event like this and meet somebody such as yourself, and we've had the conversation that perhaps um, the industry for for, um, for 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 IP needs to speed up a bit, needs to catch up, and needs to rebrand itself, I guess, and get out to the SMEs. It's okay dealing with the IBMs and you know the the, the large corporates, but if the UK economy is going to grow, um, then it's going to come from the SME sector. And it was quite scary looking at the presentation before about the um, number of universities in Germany that are doing a great deal of R&D research. And there wasn't one Welsh university on there. Um, and there were very few from, fr from the UK. Now, you know, if we're going to unlock our potential, then I believe that IP is the way forward. Small to medium-sized enterprises need to play past with that. But we need a whole support mechanism there. And that needs to encompass everything. Branding. Um, it needs to sort out, because I was saying about do you invest um, in commercial ideas. It's not saying that you don't invest in patents. You do. But they've got to be commercial patents. And I think the problem is at the moment that people don't have that support so that they're allowed to have this bright idea that nobody can help them, support them with. So they're, they're allowed to run with this, their, 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 you know, their baby, if you like, um, that, that nobody ever says, but hang on a minute, do you realise other people have had something similar and they failed or, or, or whatever? And it's a whole education process that's needed from the bottom up. So. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. So the, 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 I think it answered a better question. I and mean, the question was about faster versus slow. And, and the answer was we didn't get or we, we didn't have access to the right kind of advice. Uh, what about you, Raj? Do you feel that you've had access to the right type of commercial advice that actually gets the business and balances the business logic versus the cost and uh, and uh, r is really aligned with the business objectives? I think, uh, yeah, both yes and no in some ways. Uh, we feel at some points we have had uh, just uh, maybe spent far too much time or uh, money in IP where um, the, the one of the core things about uh, growing any new product or venture is to find out is there a market for the product or service or the innovation you're building, right? Um, and I think, yeah, you could spend a lot of time making it a little baby and wrapping a lot of uh, IP around. But I think once that question is answered, that's where the whole question of faster, slower comes in. Uh, go slow till that point where that question is answered. And if there is a lot of something commercially viable, tangible to protect, and there is a route to uh, market in terms of commercialization, then you can uh, speed things up. In terms of our own uh, patent portfolio, uh, what we did was we took the faster approach just for one market, that's the UK patent. We got it actually paid extra to have it accelerated and granted. And that helped uh, investors tick a box that is this um, uh, defensible in some way or form. And what we have gone a lot slower actually in all other markets, including our US patents and EPO, the European filings, we have just kept it pending. Because we're like, uh, you know, as long as we have one, it's just we'll have to find a commercial route and then that would advise an IP uh, strategy. And I think, uh, yeah, so and, uh, in a startup context, that strategy is a, very, uh, is a variable. Because by definition, startup is looking for a new business model and uh, the tech is changing, the landscape is changing, so much is changing. Uh, so I think it was Gareth or one of the speakers earlier who uh, mentioned it about Swift Key, and I think that's uh, uh, that's so true. Yeah. What's your view? You have a large patent portfolio, <coughs> fast or slow? Like I say that you know I would say I'll, I'll take his view. Especially it should be a holistic view. You know when you create a domain company and IP and brand, you have that and with the product in mind to commercialize, and uh, that's a key. Because I know, I remember one company about about several five, six years ago, a region therapeutic. They said that they come with a, they want to create a product called Alzheimer's disease. They have a patent. 
everybody invest in it, the company never took off, you know, but so you have to have the product and you should have the proper platform and also commercializing strategy. Then with the IP and with your domain and branding, it would take off. And especially for startup companies like small companies like us, we should have the strategy correct. So I have um, uh, touching on Ken's point um, about access to advice. Uh, so, and I, I have I have a talk later, and, and that's the whole point of the talk. But I th this is an opportunity to get to get a few more perspectives. Uh, is as an industry, as uh, IP service providers, primarily firms of patent attorneys and IP solicitors, uh, are we be are we lagging behind? I mean, accountants have zero. Um, and, and online feeds that connect to the bank and automate things. Um, and, and that's probably the closest industry to, to what lawyers do. And law firms set up uh, startups, accelerators, and invest in, uh, in, in uh, uh, legal tech companies. Is, are, are IP firms expected to move on, on offer uh, online services, apply artificial intelligence to claim drafting, and is, is there, um, from the perspective of the users, would you expect patent attorneys to step up their game um, and offer introductions to their portfolio, other portfolio companies, facilitation of business, and any, any added value that other service providers are offering? Or, or is, it, is it okay uh, for patent attorneys to say, we'll draft your patent, we'll file it on time, and we may, we'll make sure nothing will fall, and that would be enough? user's mm -hmm. perspective. So let's start Sorry. this, let's go this way. <coughs> Raj first. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, definitely from the uh, user perspective here, um, we would think if there was a tool like Zero, we use Zero for our accounting software, and you would definitely say if there was a tool like that for IP portfolio management, um, it's uh, most, I think most companies would be ready to pay a monthly subscription if there was one. Um, and maybe it doesn't exist yet, but I think there would be a user need uh, for, for that uh, sort of a thing. Um, and, and the main question here is... is do, do you, when, you, when you approach a, a patent and trademark attorney's firm or a firm of IP solicitors, uh, would you, as a user, would you expect that firm to have to add more value to the service beyond drafting your patents and protecting yes. your trademarks? Yes, I, I think we, yeah we have to at this point usually approach two different firms. If uh, you go back to that list that was laid out early on by Jan, you have the drafting, filing, then you have the IP management, which you're doing more internally, and then you have the commercialization. You almost go to another firm which commercializes some of the filings, uh, but if those can be tied together, it will be valuable. Um, and uh, yes, if your attorneys can do an introduction, I think a good way of uh, realizing the value of your intangible assets and IP is to be able to license it, um, which uh, we have also tried um, and done with a completely different sector. Um, and that's, I think you will get more value than simply selling off the patent for a 200 to 300K. That's most like what you call a patent troll, sort of a sale uh, mark, which, uh, well, I mean, if you have a mortgage to uh, pay, <laughs> so maybe that's your last resort. But ideally, I think a lot more value can be realized through licensing and your, your attorney can help do that. That's, uh, it's great. What's your view, Ken? Well, again, I don't know if the service exists, but in, in my mind, it, what I would like to see, um, as you say, it may exist, but I've, I've not seen it. Um, and I'm 60 now, and I've been in business and banking for many years, um, is somebody that understands business, um, understands what you're trying to do, gets to understand where the IP and you know, uh, you can't expect somebody to come in and understand the commercialization unless they do what I would consider a fact find. So understand where the client is trying to take it. Do a bit of a trawl to see if that IP is either out there that they can license um, or there's a fit with somebody else. And then advise. Um, 
or just take that to market. Now, in some cases, that might actually be not earning you anything. So whether there's got to be a different free, free, fee structure or what, I don't know. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know if that service exists already. Um, but it, it's not anything that I've seen in the past. Yeah, I don't know. But um, I seen it, 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 it seems a disjoint to me. So uh, I think we'll, we'll uh, wait with the goods out to the end because I want to refine the question a bit. So what about <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I would say <laughs> not only even the IP firms, even I would say as an industry, I think UK is a little bit slow in granting IP and doing the pro process itself. I, I hear from people like, you know, in Silicon Valley and US, they're saying they have a quite kind of rough type of, you know, getting the IP and also granting those IP patents. And uh, they're moving on to the next production stage or moving to the investment stage. But here we are a little bit slower and four years, ten years, sometimes sometime even twenty years, patent pending. And I think, you know, it's better it's time to dust all the... Okay. So, the, 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 I wanted to slightly refine the question because you, you talk to so many investors and I'm, I'm wondering whether investors are not actually the ones in the worst possible position uh, because uh, I, I, entrepreneurs setting up companies at least get to get the conventional advice from, from their patent attorneys. Um, and if they're lucky and the patent attorneys are commercial, then they get a, a reasonable commercial advice uh, as to uh, what should they do with their IP. Uh, and and in investors, because they need to look at so many things, particularly early stage investors, are they missing out when they get to the point where they don't get any direct independent advice, they get secondhand advice um, from, from the companies? Um, are, is, is, there a, a, is there a missing, uh, are, are patent attorney firms missing out on, on a, an easy to access product for investors that's commercially sensible and gives them a good perspective point of, 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 or point of view on what the IP actually is? Um, short answer is, is, is yes, yeah definitely. So, so when, when we invest or VCs invest, uh, particularly after do, do, during the due diligence stage, we request uh, a report on, on IP and so on. And, uh, and some choose with more details, some with less, etc. Uh, what, what is missing is exactly what you said, which is a commercially sensible and quick way of doing it, rather than just engaging with a, with a very big, very expensive law firm and then you just send things their way and they send you a massive bill at the end of the month that you go, whoa, what the heck? <laughs> and uh, and uh, so that, uh, that part, I think, it, 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 yeah, it's definitely missing. I think it's, um, it would be very helpful. And to be honest, investors really should pay far more attention than they do to IP because they tend to look at the, okay, you're getting revenues or you're getting the business model starting to work. That sort of, it's a, it's a, um, that sort of covers the risk of the IP because there's something there that is clearly already working and they're clearly being able to sell, be it a service or a product. Um, but still, there's just far too many announced. Investors really don't understand IP that well, to be honest. That is myself included. So if, uh, touching on that point, it is, it, would it be fair to say, and maybe in a slightly controversial way, that in, in those industries where IP is not core to, the, to the, the main activity, is it really a fake? I mean, is it, do, can you just show up with a portfolio of some patents filed and no yeah. one will ever look at what's actually written in them, whether it's sensible, whether it has any chances of, being, uh, <laughs> of getting anywhere and get away with it? Quite probably, to be honest. <laughs> uh, quite <laughs> probably, to be very honest. It's, um, I mean, Investors have become very wary and very skeptical about patent pending because you just see so many, then, uh, then uh, it's very quick, quick, you know, very quickly you look into it and you see that it's pretty meaningless, most of them, and, and somehow they've all been submitted just before they start going on the road to ask for money. And then they come, oh, we have, uh, whatever, 355 patents are pending. Well, yeah, what does that really mean? Um, and that's and, and why my answer earlier, which was, yeah, if you get it granted, then it's, yeah. a, it's a whole different story. Uh, but in terms of putting whatever information in there and getting away with it, yeah, with a lot of the investors. Don't tell them that I told you that, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, with a lot of them, you 
get away, they'll look, okay, we have this patent for whatever, this uh, en new enzyme or whatever. And they go, okay. And they just make sure that it's owned by the right people and etc. Yeah. So they, they check the technicalities, but, but not the substance, because it's too expensive. It's too expensive, exactly. yeah, exactly. And, and bringing back to, the, to your previous question, which is the, the, the being expensive and, and whether it's going to be, you know, whether your industry is going to be um, disrupted, uh, I think if you look at like one step, you know, if you step back a little bit and you look into other industries and how much disruption there is uh, in terms of automating things and getting, um, a lot of people say, AI too a bit too easily, but really sort of computer learning and then and then applicable. So if it, if it gets to you know the value of filing a patent uh, and making sure it's filed on time and in the right place, etc., that actually can be very easily replaced by computers. And uh, and I have no doubts that at the zero of IP will arrive and will arrive very soon. The real value is the the you know the description, the drafting, the the. The, the, and then the second part is the actually, you know, how does it work from a commercial perspective? So, for example, for IP lawyers is to help investors understand, okay, what really, what is the value of this, this patent or of this bit of IP? And that's really where machines will struggle, at least for, for a while. But, but lacking service anyway, so the humans are not providing uh, very well. No. As no. well. Yeah. Do, so touching on that point, and, and again asking the, all the users, I think, um, the, the common advice that, that you would get in, in, a, in an IP firm is, is try and get the, the broadest protection possible, and then narrow it down as you go along. That, that, um, am I right? That's, yeah. that's what everyone always says. Yeah. And, and it makes sense in the sense that this is, this is maybe or probably the way to get the broadest protection at the end of the, of the road. But if in some industries the patents are not really being examined by investors and fundraising is a major objective, and if you start very, very narrow and get something granted, you're actually scoring more points um, than uh, whoever is starting uh, um, very broad. And so you start narrow and you broaden it as you go along. Um, is, is that, are we, are we all getting bad advice? given the objectives of, of fundraising <coughs> alongside the objectives of enforcement. A, a, a broad statement to make, say, are we all getting bad advice, but certainly I was involved in, in breaking somebody's patent um, in one business that we set up, and it was, um, it was a light. And um, they'd started out with a, a broad patent and narrowed it down, and the only thing they could actually patent was the hinge. And um, <laughs> he hadn't realised because he trusted the patent lawyers to protect his design of his light, which was actually the Rolls-Royce of lights. And it had started off, we'd, he'd allowed us to use it and modify it with LEDs and one thing or another for solar-powered lighting. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he wanted to steal our idea and we fell out. And um, we broke his patent by changing the hinge. Had the light manufactured in China, still looked exactly the same. So broke, you know, didn't infringe his patent because we changed the hinge. So the, the, the it, <laughs> we negated the patent just by um, changing that. So had he been advised correctly, well, I don't think he had personally. So it, you've got to be very careful what you actually patent. And um, it was a lesson learnt for me going forward, and um, a lesson. We had all the things saying he was going to sue us, but at the end of the day, he couldn't. More perspectives? Yeah, if uh, I could add on to uh, that, it's. Um, I, I think it's not neither bad or good advice because it depends a lot on the context. So early on, I think in terms of a filing strategy, the broader you are, the better, because y you don't know how the market is going to span out. There's a lot of unknowns, but the more. Uh, as over the months and years, as those unknown variables become more uh, sort of known unknowns, then you should be able to focus and narrow down on something more tangible and more defensible. Uh, so in terms of filing strategy, broader the better, but in terms of commercialization strategy, which again, the attorneys are not very good at uh, advising maybe uh, because they just don't deal with that side of it. So, uh, but then it's better to get uh, narrower 
and and more focused. Uh, yeah, that's our that's what I would say I have probably seen from our own experience. Yeah. Okay. Even I, I, I also would like to give a use case actually. Uh, it's actually if you say IBM or NHS, it's two big juggernauts, but we have a competitive advantage and we precisely we were working on a particular subject. It's actually working with NHS blood and transplant. Uh, for do the organ transplanted into a particular human body, we did a small work using artificial intelligence, using IBM Watson, the machine learning. Using this machine learning, we gathered how many people in UK are the donors, and when, you know, it's quite difficult even to say human, when they are going to die, you know, that's a quite a I'd task. I'd like to know that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you follow up, and if that person died, and if the organ available, it comes available, how soon that you could transplant into a body or a person who is waiting for it. So it's very precise and very concise, particular use case. And if you could patent that kind of thing, you know, it's more competitive advantage for that patent rather than we'll say we work on NHS, IBM, and IBM never going to move that quick, or NHS never going to move that quick. We startups have that competitive advantage and that's IP, we should use it for our advantage. Um, so, so I think it's, it's really, because that really comes to IP strategy, and I don't really know, understand absolutely nothing of IP strategy, but one thing I understand is on how the world is changing, and I think it's really important that people look into, right, wh what is gonna look like in five years time? And it, from the IP perspective, and the, the, how technology is changing, and, and, and particularly how absolutely mammoth companies are, are taking far more than we even realize. It's, it's really important that to, to identify certain key patterns that are starting to emerge. One has been around for quite a while, which is uh, lack of, uh, of any sort of respect for IP in places like China, for example, where you had the Land Rover that was no, allegedly copied, clearly not, even though most people can't even see any difference between the, their model and the, the Land Rover. Uh, but then you also have companies based in Europe, for example, like uh, Rocket Internet, which all they do is see companies that have really good ideas, uh, usually in sort of software or web applications, in other countries, and then they, they just deploy a lot of capital into certain key markets that they know they're going to be key markets to in, those, in those spaces. So for example, if they see whatever Uber taking off in the US, they, these guys are absolutely masters in execution. Six months later, they have a, an Uber in Germany, they have an Uber in France, and then Uber, to, in order to expand, they have to buy them uh, for quite a, uh, you know, quite a lot of money. And then the third one, and that's the one that concerns me the most as an invest from the investment perspective, which is uh, companies like Google, Facebook, etc., are stopping to buy out uh, other companies and instead they just say oh that's a really cool idea but if we apply it and we link it to Gmail you know overnight we have 10 times more users than you and therefore we don't actually need to buy you and they just do it and then suddenly that company eventually just uh, unfortunately dies off sorry I just thought well, I think it's been a fascinating discussion and we have uh, maybe two minutes left so uh, an opportunity for a couple of questions from the audience so Someone must have, have must have a question. No, no questions. Okay. In that case, thank you very much. Thank you.